Sugar, number one leading cause of death. Salt, number four leading cause of death. And fat, obesity, sugar combined, all those things is, is right in there too. And yet not a single warning on anything from McDonald's. It's all perfectly legal. But he makes lots of money. You know, and so on it goes. Fast cars, you can buy a car that goes up to 260 kilometers an hour. On speed, on roads that cannot allow you to go more than 110 kilometers an hour. You actually actually sell you cars by driving through the Utah desert, monument flats, at 150 to 200 miles an hour, blowing dust behind you. Robert Daltrey screaming from won't get fooled again. And, you, and they sell cars in a manner that suggests that the way to enjoy it is to be illegally speed really fast. And they sell them that way. And it's totally legal. They're never asked to call. It says in small letters, this is a stunt track. Do not try this on a highway of your choice. Right. But basically, they're still selling it to it. And so when it goes gun to them, I've never seen anybody who manufactured a gun called call to account for the deaths they caused by guns. And even in Walkerton, Ontario, the guy killed people at the water factory. Like, so government-approved water killed 12 people four years ago in Walkerton, Ontario, and that guy got house arrest. And I was risky, killed 12 people. Fell asleep right at literally the switch and let a whole bunch of cryptosporidium get into the water supply. Didn't tell anybody once he knew it was in there, so he's criminally liable. 12 people die and he gets house arrest, right? Now remember that when you hear I've gotten five years in a federal penitentiary for giving seeds that don't hurt anybody, that have brought more greatness to our world than anything else. And gee, here's the irony of that, though. Let me just tell you. And I will jump all over the place, so you know, every now and then you have to reel me in and remind me of where I last was. But you know, the, one of the great things I'm going to tell you is how many great people use marijuana to produce their great stuff. And I've just established that everything legal is going to kill you. It's all delivered with a lie. You, said, you know, and this, schools don't tell us the truth about drugs, right? The police don't tell us. In fact, we have five natural enemies. Parents, teachers, priests, politicians, and cops. Because they all want unquestioned obedience. They all thrive on the hypocrisy of the truth not being told. None of them can tell the truth. Parents never tell you the truth about drugs. They don't tell you the truth about lots of things. They just say, basically, do as I do. And, sorry, do as I say, not as I do. Right? And teachers are the same thing. They need unquestioned obedience. Every teacher's got lots of experience with drugs. But they can't tell any of their students because they'll be fired. And the priests and their mumbo-jumbo you know, reiterate people to keep a lifestyle that's dangerous and net, but they don't want to hear anything that breaks into their dogma. And same with the politicians, you know, and, and our police. They want unquestioned obedience. So they're always our enemy to the cannabis culture. Because here's what happened. When you first started smoking marijuana, and for some of you that would be grade 8, grade 9, others would be later. I was a late bloomer. I started smoking marijuana when I was 22. But one thing that immediately happens when you smoke marijuana, this certainly happened to her with my wife when she was speaking with her pop friends and she first smoked pop for the first time, her, her eyes were opened up. All of a sudden, everything she was told by the prohibitionist world was a lie. And marijuana makes that so crystal clear. Oh my God, it's all lies. For example, you know, every single place I've been to in, Bank, in Canada, we wiped out the natives through genocide. And in, in fact, in Halifax, we had several genocides by one guy alone. And there's a big statue in, in Halifax to General Cornwallis. And I said, All right, do people know that he was responsible for the Acadian genocide and then the genocide of the South uh, Nova Scotia Indians? And he wiped out everybody he could in order to colonize that place for the British. And, and he got rid of the Acadians, sent them to Louisiana in a mass expulsion, killed out all the natives. And then when I went to St. John's, Newfoundland, I said, you know that they wiped out the Bantuck Indians here all by 1832 gave them smallpox-laden blankets. And when I go to my hometown, London, Ontario, they did the same thing there. Wiped out the entire native population in the space of one generation by giving out poison blankets to all the local Indians. And same with OU, and everywhere I've been in Canada. We use genocide as a way of ethnic, and it's ethnic cleansing to get where we want. But you never hear that in school, because then you'd feel bad about your country. Instead of Canada, true north, strong and free, how about 400 years of rape and pillage, and this is what we've got to show for it. That should be the model. Of That's what we had, but you don't hear that, right? And just like you don't hear any truth in school about drugs of any kind, right? You read all these books that are irrelevant. You learn math, code, calculus, and, and algebra. You don't even need to learn one thing about numbers in school. And that's money. Everything is about money. If they taught me how to manage a checkbook and a credit card and a ledger book, that would have made so much more sense for anybody I was in school as well as myself. Everything I learned in math is completely irrelevant. Calculus, algebra, never use it. They haven't even thought about it since, right? Couldn't, I, I can tell you what an isosceles triangle is, but basically, even that's never helped me out. You know, I, I know what was all that about? Five years of mathematics, pointless. Five years of reading about books that have no relationship to my... You know, I read books in school about the, the beauty of the rural environment. I lived in an urban environment all my life. I never read an urban environment. 
environment book until I was like grade 12 in English. It's all about the beautiful aspects of nature and, and the and sort of thing. So all of school was this wonderland of propaganda that didn't bear a relationship to facts and reality at all. Everything you've been told that's legal is going to kill you. Everything you've been told that's legal is wrong and it's a lie. And the things you've been told about pot were especially damnable lies. Because as we've established, nobody ever dies from marijuana. It, it, can, it can cure you, it can help you, it can and do amazing things for you. And it's that cloud, that veil, that gets pulled back when you smoke marijuana that is why we're undelic animals. Undelic animals. Because we become critical things. As soon as you smoke pot, you go, oh my God, I realize what a hypocritical pile of swill the whole world is. And then you decide, oh my God, what am I going to do about this? Right? And that's the big thing. What am I going to do about this? Because here, here's the thing. The world that's out there that's legal and promoted and, and pushed on to you is all bad and all going to kill you. And I think we've established that. Cannabis won't ever hurt you. It's not going to kill you. It's not. It's going to help you. It's going to help you whether you've got MS or Crohn's disease. It's going to help you stop getting Alzheimer's. And so, in fact, you know, we've actually contributed so much to the world. For example, here's a good thing. When you come up to prohibitionists or straight people and you say, well, how do you feel about marijuana? And they say something negative towards it. And say, well, are you aware that we owe so much of the modern era? Everything we all have has come from the minds of a prophet. I said, would you like to think about that? Because that's a good place to start. Because anybody who likes a Mac computer, an iPod, or an iPhone has to thank a pot. It's Stephen Jobs, when he developed the Mac computer, was a total utter pothead in the 1970s. And so everything we can be grateful for that came from a Mac computer at Apple Corporation is came from the mind of a pothead. But don't stop there. Bill Gates and Paul Allen, the founders of Microsoft, both total stoners in the 1970s when they developed Microsoft. <laughs> Bill Gates probably hasn't had a good idea since then. He's, <laughs> in the 1980s, he's, he's been living off Microsoft and that invention ever since. right? And Ted Turner, the founder of CNN, Cutting Edge News Network, uh, was a, is a pothead then, is a pothead now. And I'm, basically what I'm saying to you is, Great people produce great things inspired by marijuana. I'm not talking about the guy who's in charge of CVS here, or the president of Price Waterhouse Accounting. Nobody gives a shit what they're doing, because they're not cutting edge. They don't give us the beauty and joy of the world that a guy like CNN changed the way we look at the news, right? Um, Stephen Jobs changed the way we, we deal with data processing and computers. Bill Gates revolutionized the world, right? Moses Neimer, the founder of City TV and Much Music, cutting edge thing, smokes a big bomber every day, right? I mean, William Shakespeare, the father of the English language, his pipes have tested positive for hashish. The greatest writer in the English language that every teacher refers to as the most important person in the pantheon of great writers in English was a pothead, right? The greatest athlete of the modern era, Michael Phelps, who's got 16 gold medals. He's even got two bronze medals. He probably uses his doilies. Just as, as a glass. He's don't look at those bronze medals. They were a mistake. Don't right? He's got 16 gold medals for a guy who uses his lungs to win, and he's a bong hitter, all right? <laughs> William Shakespeare, the greatest writer, Michael Phelps, the greatest athlete of all time, right? Stephen Jobs, Bill Gates, Moses Snyder, Ted Turner, uh, Carl Sagan, one of the most printed, excellent, most famous scientists of the modern era. Every one of his last scientific series, seven of them, he developed by smoking pot and going into the shower, turning on the hot water, and writing formula in the glass shower doors and the steam that would come from them, right? And most basketball players, Ross Robiati, smoking marijuana, the 1990 gold medalist. We've got power lifters that have just been disqualified from the last Olympics that smoked marijuana. People smoke, let's just say, you remember those iPods and iPhones we were talking about? iPod, what's on an iPod? Right, let's, let's look. The most accessible thing in the world is music. More people say they love music than any other thing on earth. Now, lots of people like ice cream, but not everybody likes ice cream. You know, a lot of people like hockey or baseball, but not everybody likes hockey or baseball. Every single person, when you ask a survey, says they like music. Every single person says they have a song in their heart or songs they know that they love and care about. And so everybody always answers to the affirmative, how do you care about music? I love music. Well, what exactly is on that item? What exactly music are we talking about the last few years? Let's look at the biggest names in pop music, the Beatles. Paul McCartney's looking great at 66. He looks like he's 36, smokes a big bomb. He's been convicted three times of marijuana. Over 30 Beatles songs have references to marijuana in them. And Got to Get You Into My Life is all about marijuana by Paul McCartney. And John Lennon was a great advocate. He came to the Canadian Parliament in 1969 along with his bed in Montreal. He also told the Parliamentary Committee that listened to him that the two things that Canada could do to make two, you know, this country great would be to legalize gay marriage and to legalize marijuana. 
And that was in 1969. And he was a great advocate of it and a great user. And I think probably Paul McCartney and John Lennon have more great pop music between the two of them than anybody else in the modern era. The work of potheads. And who inspired them? to try marijuana that revolutionized their writing. That was Bob Dylan, the greatest poet of the modern era, is a pothead. And what about Robert Plant and Led Zeppelin? The first known picture of Robert Plant is him holding up a sign saying, legalized pot in 1967. You know, Led Zeppelin, the greatest hard metal band of all time, potheads. And what about the Rolling Stones, perhaps the first, second, or third greatest rock band of all time? Right now, I can tell you they're still potheads. In fact, I met their daughters, Lizzie Jagger and Theodora Richards, came into our store and spent a lot of time there one day and told us that they're, both their parents own a castle, Miss Jagger has a castle and Keith Richards has a castle, and they've got one big room in their castle, each of them. It's all devoted to things about cannabis and with hookahs and pipes and bongs and plaques and things on the wall and posters and stuff that the two daughters collect when they go around the world. They collect these things. So right now, Mick Jagger and uh, Keith Richards, both in their own castle, have a room dedicated to weed, all about it. Right? And why stop there? Green Day in the modern era. Almost every major hip-hop artist from Snoop Dogg to Jay-Z to Dre, all the great ones are smoking marijuana. And why stop there? Look at reggae music. Bob Marley. The greatest icon to oppress people in the world is Bob Marley. More people recognize Bob Marley's profile and picture than any other person on earth for all oppressed people. It's amazing. Pictures of Bob Marley abound everywhere you find uh, people under pressure, under oppression. Right, Bob Marley, Peter, all of reggae music is the music of reefer. And what about the original music of reefer, jazz music? The music that started in the 1920s that started rock and roll, that basically influenced all our modern pop music to this day. It started with guys like Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, Billy, Billy Holly, and all these people smoking a lot of pot in the 1920s and 30s. Now that, actually, is the subtext to why marijuana was made illegal in the United States. 